My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Following our celebration of new ministry last Sunday, my partner and I invited a group of friends to our house for some drinks to celebrate and mark the occasion. As with most gatherings at our house, our conversation naturally alternated from lighthearted and humorous to more serious subjects. But halfway through the night, one of our friends raised the topic of faith and religion. Well, I'm not naturally inclined to raise the subject with friends. I was intrigued by the conversation. How would they respond to his questions? Most of my friends, you see, don't identify as religious or church-going persons. Several, in fact, have been deeply hurt, wounded, and rejected by members of the church. As such, few of them would ever even step into a church were it not for their desire to support me, none of them would have been here the other night. Yet they all came to church last Sunday and shared in our celebration. Given their experience of other Christians in the church, I was surprised by the way our conversation unfolded. Almost immediately, we turned to Jesus, who he was and what he was about. My friends shared how they felt Jesus embodied the graciousness of God in his teaching and actions. Jesus' ministry resonated with my friends, and they expressed a deep yearning to experience the compassion and grace of God. I was deeply moved as I listened to my friends express their innermost thoughts about God, faith, and life. Our discussion remained with me for much of the week. I reflected upon what my friends shared and what we could learn from them. It was clear God was doing a new thing in them. And in the following days, I received a handful of text messages from some of them telling me how moved they were by our liturgy that night and how it stirred within them a desire for more. What stood out for me the most was my friend's desire to experience the compassion and grace of God in a tangible way. They wanted to feel the presence of God. As I considered our conversation over the course of the following days, I came across our first reading for this Sunday, the reading from the book of Revelation, in which we hear the mystic John relate his vision of a new heaven and a new earth. God's presence, we are told, will be among God's people, and they shall be relieved of their suffering and death. John's vision is quite powerful and hopeful. Yet it is a vision I'm afraid few of us have. Like my friends, we long for God here and now, and not in some future time unknown to us. But is John's vision a, a, a dream of a future reality, or is it a reality unfolding before us? Is God here among us now, or are we awaiting for God to be present in some future age? I suspect that most people imagine the new heaven and the new earth that John speaks of as some far off and distant time. We see this even in pop culture with movies and films about some future time when the suffering of this age shall be no more. We need, yet, we need not fault them for thinking this way, given the many televangelists preaching a dualist world in which we are living in an evil age and the, 
end time will be preceded with good people taken away from us. If you don't believe me, just pick up the books like the Left Behind series, or listen to dozens of evangelical preachers on Sunday announce God's kingdom will come with a mighty wrath one day. The problem with such teaching and depiction of the end time is that they fail to appreciate Jesus' ministry and the ministry he entrusted to his disciples. My friend's observation that Jesus embodied the presence of God here and now was more accurate than what most evangelists suggest. If we carefully listen to the Gospels, we will hear Jesus call us to embody, us to embody, God's presence here and now. Just consider Jesus' new command at the Last Supper when he instructed the disciples to wash each other's feet. He tells the disciples, and us, that when we lovely care for the least among us, we receive God. He then instructs his disciples to love one another as he has loved us. Our modern understanding of God's presence as something distant and far off would have been foreign to the ancient Israelites and early Christians. For one thing, the people of Israel understood themselves as God's chosen people, a people called to manifest God's presence in the world. We Christians still hold this as true. The people of Israel are God's chosen people. Yet Jesus expands and broadens the circle of those called and chosen to include not only the people of Israel, but all of humanity. All of us are called to embody in our life and work the presence of God. Our ministry and the ministry of every baptized Christian it's to proclaim through word and action the goodness of God living and active in our world today. When people see us, they ought to see and experience the grace, peace, and love of God. And the duty of every Christian is to confront injustice and evil with peace, compassion, joy, and love. All of us are set apart for a mission and purpose to make known the goodness of God and to work with God in bringing about the new heaven and earth. We are called to be the holy ones of God. We are called to be saints. Now, to understand this more fully, I think we need to turn to the Gospel lesson for today. The story of the raising of Lazarus from the dead is the final act of Jesus before his passion, death, and resurrection. It is, according to John, the very thing that condemns Jesus to his death. Lazarus' illness and death is an occasion for Jesus to reveal his presence, the presence of God, to Martha, Mary, and the mourners gathered, gathered with them. An earlier verse, one we did not hear today, but a critical un sentence to understanding this whole story, is Jesus' proclamation that he is the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and life. Jesus' proclamation, I am, is an announcement that the world to come is already here. It is upon us. God's great act of saving and liberating us is not something far off in the future, but present to us here and now. Jesus comes to liberate Lazarus, not just from the tomb, but from the things that bind him. But he does not do so alone. Well, it is Jesus and his grace that liberates and frees Lazarus from the bonds of death. Jesus commands Martha and Mary to work with him in proclaiming the freedom of God. Listen carefully to the imperative verbs in the story. 
unbind Lazarus. Take away the stone. God works not alone, but commands us to work with God in removing the obstacles that prohibit others from experiencing the fullness of life here and now. In other words, we are to embody the life-giving grace and love of God in all we do. Just as Jesus manifested the presence of God in his life, so are we. But for us to radiate the generous hospitality and graciousness of God, we, we must first die to our own selfish wants and desires and to let go of those things that prohibit us from loving others more fully, such as our own pride. This is why we are immersed into the waters of baptism, to die to our old selves and to be born into the new life of God. As soon as we emerge from the waters, our heads are anointed with oil and we become another Christ, God's presence in the world. And this is what it means to be saints. To be a people who strive to embody the graciousness of God and work with God in liberating those bound by the things that oppress. Hatred, violence, inequality, oppression, discrimination, and all forms of injustice. Instead, we are to work with God's grace in making known God's lavish and life-giving love for all. And we do this in the ordinary moments of life. The life of a saint is not an easy one, to be sure. God will pull and stretch us in ways we could never imagine. And God will challenge us to go to the places where we feel most uncomfortable. And believe me, God does. God will push you. And that's a good thing. God will push you to the places of pain, brokenness, and loneliness. We must cultivate a life of daily prayer, study of scripture, and regular celebration of the Eucharist if we are to embody the lavish love of God in all we do. For we cannot be Christ if we don't first come to know Christ. So, my friends, i got a challenge for you. Will you embody the gracious love of God in your life? Will you be a saint? If yes, then let us walk together and learn the way of love from the one who is holy, Jesus Christ himself. Amen.